He frowned and said, That's a stupid idea. It will never work. How many times have you heard some variation of that in the workplace? When someone's trying to brainstorm, share new ideas, genuinely just trying to help the conversation along, there's someone that shoots down everything they say, someone that's always confrontational. That's what I'm going to talk about today. How to stop competing and start collaborating like a real team. I'm Larry Cornett, and this is Invincible Career. So I'm going to share a few links to some of the resources I mentioned in this episode. If you go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com, this is How to Stop Competing and Truly Start Collaborating, Issue 436. And it's all about what it should mean to be on the same team, what it should mean, not, not what it often is but what we all wished it would be. Uh, And the story I shared is, you know, kind of a sanitized version of many things that I've been through and many things that my clients have experienced, my friends have experienced in the corporate world, in other workplaces. And it is, uh, it's a real problem having somebody shoot stuff down. In this case, the person came back and said, how do you know it will never work? You know, we haven't even tested it yet. And he leaned back in his chair with a slightly smug look on his face. I'm sure you've seen that. I've been working on this product for five years. We've tested hundreds of concepts. And we tested something like this a couple of years ago. It failed. She was frustrated. This isn't the same. And timing matters. It tested well in the lab. So I want to get more data from an A-B test. He shook his head. I disagree. That's a waste of resources. Well, she said, looks like we're at an impasse. I guess it's time to escalate this. I lost count of how many meetings I attended like this when I worked in tech. I used to be a designer. uh, And then I was a design manager and leader. And then I worked in product. These meetings were not uncommon. You know, the ones that were supposed to be collaboration sessions, but turned into debates. We seem to have lost our way with team meetings. Too many arguments, too many show-offs trying to prove how smart they are, too many people trying to win instead of actually working together to reach a great outcome. Unfortunately, As I said, this type of exchange isn't uncommon in the working world. I'm sure you've experienced it. Even when we say we're going to collaborate, brainstorm, and discuss an issue in a meeting, it's actually not very collaborative. Everyone has an opinion. Emotions run high. and People get stuck on their pet theories. It becomes a debate to see who can persuade the other that they are right or Force them to back down through intimidation tactics. It's probably true in every profession and probably almost every industry. But boy, oh boy, do we ever love to argue in Silicon Valley. If you've spent any time in Silicon Valley, in tech meetings, lots of arguments. Almost every meeting felt like a debate with one or two literal geniuses in the room to boot, just to make sure you felt really inferior So many of us love to argue, demonstrate how smart we are, and crush our competitors in debates. And I'm not saying I was above it all. I competed competed in debate and persuasive speaking when I was younger. I used to. And as my wife will tell you, I kind of enjoy arguing. I don't take it personally. It's strangely fun for me to debate an issue, to play devil's advocate. However, as much as some of us might enjoy these confrontational discussions, it's not the most effective way for teams to work together toward a common goal. When everyone is trying to win, the team often loses. Even in the healthiest of collaboration sessions, 
the full cognitive horsepower isn't fully aligned to drive the process forward in the same direction at the same time. You know, for example, one person will propose a creative idea, another person inevitably starts shooting it down, someone else in the room says, hey, hey, and tries to share some useful data they think might help the discussion, yet another person says, you know, this idea just doesn't feel right. And someone else in the room is already at the whiteboard trying to share a completely different idea, their pet idea. What if everyone's thinking process was aligned? So the team was rowing in the same direction at the same time. What if people stopped viewing each other as opponents and competitors sitting across the debate table? What if we joined each other side by side? and felt like partners working together on an issue. Not us versus them. Instead, it becomes us versus the problem. With parallel thinking, you don't stop and debate every point as it's made, unlike traditional meetings where it seems to happen constantly. And it reminds me a bit of writing, because I do (laughs) write a lot, It is a slow, laborious process when people try to write and edit at the same time. They barely get any work done. But if you separate the two activities, you can get into a creative flow state. Write and let the idea stream onto the screen with no judgment, no editing, no stopping to fix misspellings, no stopping to fix a grammatical error. And then... Once you're done, once your writing session is finished, you can return to the document later, hours later, next day, whatever, to edit and revise it. Separate those two activities, those two modes. Imagine working together to be creative at the same time with your team. Positive at the same time and look for issues and problems at the same time. No more competing across the table for things you want versus what they want. I worked in more traditional nine to five hourly jobs, you know, those good old days of clocking in and clocking out, had the usual bosses and coworkers for about 10 years, at least before I entered graduate school and then everything changed. You know, for the most part, these jobs were not high stress jobs. Although there were some tense moments as a police dispatcher, as you can imagine, most of the jobs I worked, most of the people I worked with treated a job as a job. They didn't think of it as a career. People worked just hard enough. I even had veteran employees tell me, hey, slow down, take it easy. You still get paid the same. Don't make everyone else look bad. There wasn't much competition at all, and promotions were kind of rare. In my experience, you got promoted simply by sticking around long enough. Staff turnover at jobs like this was incredibly frequent. For example, I became what we call Delta 47. It's an inside joke for those of you that have known me for a long time. Uh, But I got promoted when I stayed long enough to become the shift supervisor. And everybody I worked with, we were all friends and we were working in the trenches together. Now, the salaried corporate world was so very different. When I joined that experience about 30 years ago, I discovered it was much more competitive. There were so many arguments about who was right or wrong. People trying to persuade others to their point of view. People deliberately withholding information as a power play. That was new for me. That was new for me. I was an open book back then. Um, Man, I shared everything, my thoughts, what I was learning, being very open about alternatives. And then I discovered there were people who did not do that. They were deliberately keeping that information secret because it it gave them power. I mean, it seems like the spirit of true collaboration was missing. It still is. It was more like cooperation. We cooperated enough to get work done, but no one could forget the underlying competition for resources, power, right? 
My decision was the, uh, the one that was accepted, not yours. Visibility to the executives, getting credit, doing work that would impact your bonus, your getting a raise, getting promoted. Nobody could forget that. The higher purpose of what we were working on, what we were doing was lost to. If individuals, teams, and organizations are all competing on some level and to some degree, what an unfortunate loss of energy and focus that is. Energy that could be aligned to do amazing things for customers, right? For humanity. I think about what is not being done right now because everybody is so busy competing. I'm going to use two different metaphors to describe what the true spirit of collaboration might look like for your teams and your companies. So if you have coworkers, if you are a boss, a manager, if you run your own company, what could this be like? And it's the metaphor of tables and hats. <laughs> so this is inspired by two sources that have stuck in my mind ever since I encountered them. You know, sometimes you read something, sometimes you experience something that stays with you forever. One, it's called Sitting on the Same Side of the Table, The Art of Collaborative Selling. That's by Michael Levin. And two, Six Thinking Hats by Dr. Edward DeBono. And so I've linked more information to those. If you go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com, you could find that. Or maybe you've heard of it already. So I'm going to start with that table concept because it is a simple mindset shift and approach. And I should say simple to understand, but not always simple to do, of course. So let's talk about sitting on the same side of the table. I think I first heard that phrase, hey, sit on the same side of the table, many years ago from Jason Calacanis. He's an angel investor, uh, pretty well-known in the tech industry, Silicon Valley. Uh, since then, I've learned that there's a great book on sales written by Michael Levin. It's called Sitting on the Same Side of the Table, The Art of Collaborative Selling. I linked that so you can go find it. Uh, it's on his website. The idea is to shift from a hardcore negotiation style, you know, facing each other across the table, to sitting side by side with your customer while you work out solutions that are good for both of you. The current world of Zoom meetings forces us into meetings where it appears as if we are across from each other, right? But think back to the last meeting you had in a physical room. And maybe that was a long time ago. Maybe you're back in the office. I don't know. Maybe you never left the office. Now, if it was a confrontational meeting and you expected some debate and argument, you probably sat in chairs across the table from the folks on the other side of the issue. I know that most of my tense meetings were like that. We certainly didn't sit next to each other. However, I remember deliberately experimenting with this seating arrangement in one critical meeting with a head of product from another organization. There had been some tension between our teams and some disagreement about the direction our products were going and how they interacted. We had to work pretty closely together. I wanted the meeting to be a collaborative session instead of combative. So when I entered the conference room, I sat next to them on the same side of the table, right by the whiteboard. And it was kind of funny. They, they pulled back a little and they looked at me with surprise, like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I said, hey, I want to sketch some concepts on the whiteboard and I want to show you a prototype on my laptop. I was completely transparent about the goals. I wanted the solution to be something we agreed upon and would end up being a win for both of us, with the ultimate win really being for the company, if it worked out for both of our products. The session was pretty amazing, and it changed the nature of our relationship from that day forward. I mean, no, we didn't become best friends, but I like to think there was mutual respect, and this person actually went out of their way to meet with me many months later and share some helpful advice. There is incredible power in solving a problem together versus being opponents 
facing each other on opposing sides of the table, literally in person and figuratively online. So that's a mindset shift. It's thinking about you on the same side of the table, working together, facing the problem, not facing each other. So the second big metaphor is about wearing the same hat. So I learned about this collaboration and decision-making model in Dr. Edward DeBono's book. And thank you for introducing me to the book, Justin, if uh, you ever hear this or read this. He knows who he is. So there's a quote from DeBono. The main difficulty of thinking is confusion. We try to do too much at once. Emotions, information, logic, hope, and creativity all crowd in on us. It's like juggling with too many balls. So what it's about is being in the same thinking mode at the same time versus the typical opposing mindset of disagreement and argument and debate. Instead, you all are being creative at the same time. You all look for flaws at the same time. You stay in that mode together until it's time to switch. So there is the hat metaphor. I mean, there's white, red, black, yellow, green, and blue. So the white hat is neutral and objective. It's all about facts and figures. The red hat is the emotional view. The black hat is about being cautious and careful. That's the devil's advocate hat. The yellow hat is being positive. Green hat is about growth, creativity, new ideas. And the blue hat is about being above everything else like the sky. It's the organizing hat. Now, some people love this concept. And some people are not fans. (laughs) If you look at the reviews, most are very positive, but there are people who are not fans. And I think a lot of that is if they're not doing it the right way. And DeBono talks about that. They're not doing it the right way. If everyone isn't fully on board with the process, it's not going to work. It's not. If psychological safety is absent in the organization, it will not work. So team psychological safety is a shared belief held by members of a team that it's okay to take risks, to express their ideas and concerns, to speak up with questions and to admit mistakes, all without fear of negative consequences. That's the key. The power of the thinking hats approach is making sure that everyone is collaborating on a problem in that same mode of thinking at the same time. Instead of arguing, debating, and defending your ideas or point of view against your colleagues, you talk about the problem in a collaborative way as you view it from the same perspective at the same time. And he gave this example. It's like, imagine viewing a large, complex building from the outside. If each person is on a different side of the building, what you think you're seeing and how you would describe it is very different from everyone else. This is kind of similar to the you know, touching an elephant in a dark room, right? If or you're wearing a blindfold, it's like, what is this thing? Uh, but if you all come together and visit each side of the house at the same time, you now have a shared perspective and you can have a great conversation about what it actually is, what's going on. This is referred to as parallel thinking in the book. I talked about that. It's constructive collaboration thinking, collaborative thinking versus adversarial thinking. It's sharing everything together in the most open and honest way possible to ensure everyone has all the information required to produce the best possible outcome. That's what it is, right? You're trying to get the best possible outcome. It's not about winning. You don't withhold information that could help simply because you're trying to win. Because you want to win and you don't want to share relevant data that might help quote your opponent. Parallel thinking aligns the team fully with one thinking approach at the same time, viewing the problem from the same perspective simultaneously. You are not opponents. It's not you versus them. It's all of you versus the problem again. And the colored hats, some people think are silly, but it is, it's a quick cue to move into a specific mode of thinking, communicating, and sharing. And DeBono makes the point that the language we usually use to talk about things like emotions, negative consequences, creativity, etc., they're insufficient. And they, they have some baggage. You know, people are reluctant to fully share their personal feelings about an issue with their boss in the room. 
but it's different when you're just putting on the hat and sharing, well, hey, here's some emotions about this issue. The hats make the exercise more objective and not about the individual. For example, it's not you being negative. You're not being negative. You're simply sharing black hat thinking. You're objectively pointing out, hey, here are things that might go wrong with a proposed course of action. I'm going to try to briefly summarize each of the hats. I know there's not a lot of time left, but this barely covers what's available in the book. I highly recommend getting the book. It's not a, it's not a huge book. It doesn't take a lot of time to read it. Uh, blue hat mode. Usually the group assigns one person to act as, quote, the blue hat. They play the role of facilitator slash moderator. So you set the stage for the discussion. You know, what's the purpose of the meeting? What's the issue or problem we're going to work on? And what do we need to have achieved by the end of this session? What's the outcome we want? They share the proposed agenda with the sequence of using some or all of the hats as they work on the issue. You don't have to use every single hat. Um, So you could say, let's start with the red hat to get everyone's feelings about this issue. It doesn't take that long. Then we're going to move into the white hat and share all the data and information we have. And after that, I want to go into the green hat and start generating some new ideas about how we might solve the problems. Um, the blue hat person will remind participants to stay in a specific mode of thinking because it's hard. It's new. Most people drift in and out of what they should be doing. They revert to their preferred hat, like being a black hat. So you might say, Hey Tom, that's black hat thinking. And we're still in the yellow hat part of the discussion. So save that for later. Okay. So you're not saying, Hey Tom, you're being negative. Tom, you're such a downer. You're just saying, hey, that's black hat thinking. So it's separating the individual from the action. At the end, the blue hat will ask for the outcome. Okay, what's our decision? And talk about next steps. So we all agree this is the best course of action. Next steps, let's loop in the rest of the team to start planning the work on this new strategy. Um, So let me talk about the white hat. So in the white hat mode, you're sharing information and data you have with your colleagues but without any emotional interpretation, no bias. Like what is actually happening? What is the actual data? What are the facts? Everybody puts it on the table together and you want to be neutral and objective. You know, unlike most meetings where some people withhold information, if it doesn't support their personal agenda, you're supposed to share everything, but not be emotional about it. Don't argue about the data. Data is data. This isn't the time to do that. Don't debate it, which usually happens no judgment. It's all about being, you know, Mr. Spock, if you ever watch Star Trek. Red hat mode, you know, in typical business discussions, you're not supposed to allow your emotions to cloud your judgment. You know, you're not supposed to become heated during a debate. First person who loses their cool loses the argument, right? Well, emotions do do run high in business meetings, uh, but it's often not a shared experience. It's rarely constructive. And it's hard to feel safe and creative when an executive is cursing at you shouting at you, threatening you. So the red hat mode lets everybody safely express feelings, emotions, and intuition. And you do not have to explain or justify your feelings. It's all valid. And this doesn't take very long. It's kind of a gut check moment. Black hat mode. This is going to feel very familiar. (laughs) It seems to be the go-to activity for many people in meetings. I'm sure you've worked with several folks who almost immediately shoot down any new idea And they're happy to explain why something will never work. Just like I was talking about at the beginning. I mean, I sure have. But it is a valid and useful thinking activity. Your legal team loves this activity. (laughs) But it is so much more effective when everyone agrees to be in that mode at the same time. Versus debating and arguing throughout the entire meeting. Which is what usually happens. So the black hat is about caution and survival. It's about identifying things that might be unprofitable unethical, destructive, dangerous, illegal. You discuss potential downsides, the risks, the flaws, the weaknesses, concerns you have, like what could go wrong and how will we react if something goes wrong? Really useful for your planning, coming up with contingency plans. But the magic, the big difference here is that you're engaging in this type of thinking together. And at the right time in the meeting, instead of constantly derailing a productive discussion, it gets old, right? Yellow hat, this is the optimism. And it's kind of fun, especially fun for someone who's not used to it. 
uh, watching one of your colleagues who's usually quite negative about everything suddenly start sharing positive examples of potential benefits and value and opportunities. It's kind of refreshing. And again, the magic is everybody's doing it at the same time. Everybody's engaging in positive thinking at the same time. When is the last time you experienced that? It's, it's been a long time for me. It's a good idea still to consider probabilities and reality, even when you're being positive. I mean, yeah, it'd be nice if a knight rode up on a unicorn and handed your team a billion-dollar budget, but it's highly unlikely, so why even mention that? Some examples, ways to prompt this kind of thinking. What is our vision of the future? What are the opportunities ahead of us? What does success look like? How does the future change if we succeed? What are the ways this could work out well for us? How will this change people's lives for the better? How could we improve this even more? So green hat mode, if you've ever attended a brainstorming session, you're quite familiar with wearing the green hat. And if you had an excellent facilitator, they ensured that everyone stayed in the mode of generating new ideas before debating or arguing or trying to interrupt someone's creative flow. It's like, hey, just let the ideas come out. This is all about saying what is possible. How can we disrupt our industry? How far can we push things? What new ideas do we have? What is your wildest idea? What are the alternatives? How can you build on someone else's idea? What course of action could we take to make this happen? Now, one thing I want to point out, I've talked about this before in the past when I talk about introversion. Not everyone could be put on the spot in a meeting and immediately just let loose with creative ideas. Some of us don't work that way. And that includes me. Uh, I need time to be alone, to think and let the ideas flow and simmer a bit. I need some time. And there are other people like that. There's probably somebody on your team like that. So I recommend you give your colleagues time to prepare Let them know that you're going to do this brainstorming session. Give them the agenda. Review the data and information available so everybody kind of knows coming into the meeting. And let them generate some ideas on their own before coming to that green hat session to share and develop them together. I know there was a lot. There's more. Uh, I kind of skimmed through some of that stuff in the newsletter. Go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com. And I highly recommend checking out the book, Six Thinking Hats by Dr. Edward DeBono, if you want to learn more about how you could apply this methodology to your own team discussions. So really, I want to wrap this up just saying this is an opportunity to become allies, not competitors. And I know it sounds funny to say that. Competitors with my colleagues and coworkers? Come on. Come on. We know it's happening. You've experienced it. And the higher you climb the career ladder, the more you're going to see it. So first, let me be clear about something. You need a reasonably healthy culture, both in the company and your own organization and psychological safety to open up and embrace the six thinking hats methodology. You will fail if others refuse to commit to the process. It's not going to work if people won't do it, if they won't try. You will fail if you don't feel completely safe being honest and transparent with the information you have. It's hard to be vulnerable and share everything you know with your colleagues if they simply take advantage of it to go for the kill and take the win. However, if your team really does want to find a better way to collaborate, to work together, to make decisions, there's hope. Introduce them to the book and the process. Start experimenting with it in your meetings. Take note of how it hopefully improves the quality of your discussions and outcomes. And DeBono shares some great examples from various industries and some pretty large companies about how much more effective their meetings are doing this, how much shorter their meetings can be. They can reduce the process by getting rid of the fluff and getting everybody aligned, how they've had some great outcomes from it, much more creative outcomes, solving problems more quickly. And I can tell you work can feel pretty amazing when your coworkers are genuinely your partners seeking the best outcomes, if you're both on the same side of the table, right? Metaphorically, I've had this experience in small startups. It is rare and it feels magical to be aligned with a common goal and no hidden agendas. 
So I am curious, have you tried this approach in your organization before? Are you familiar with this? Have you tried it? I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear about your experiences. If you can go and leave a comment, I know with a podcast, it is impossible. I wish there was a better way to do this. But if you go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com, this is how to stop competing and truly start collaborating, issue 436, uh, leave a comment. Let me know if this has worked for you and what you've heard about it. But I'd love to see if uh, this can improve the collaboration and decision-making within your organization. Until next time, I wish you the best of luck in becoming an opportunity magnet for the best things in life.